There was a time at the beginning of the 20th century where many different philosophical ideas were being presented for the first time and different schools ended up going down different paths with the elaboration of those ideas. So the first school of thought might be considered to be the existentialists. Sartre, Heidegger, even Camus. And they were addressing the problem of groundlessness. That especially Camus put his emphasis on the absurd, which is our the arbitrariness of our position in the world and the purposelessness of grasping for some kind of concrete meaning just doesn't exist. The nature and structure of the world don't allow for that sort of thing. So the kind of experience he was producing in his readers was the same experience that a child has when they realize that they have an accent. Every young child thinks that they speak in the normal way and when they hear a foreigner speak their language, they hear them speaking with an accent and they think, well, those people must have an accent that's different. But then, of course, their parents are wise. They inform them that, no, you, in fact, also have an accent. There is no normal way of speaking. And so Camus, like a, the wise parent uh, that he was to people, he points out that everything you take as being default the fact that you're a person on a planet, that you breathe air, that you drive a car, anything that you do, anything you take for granted is completely and utterly arbitrary. It can't possibly be explained by recourse to some causal principle. That entire project was abandoned along with God. And of course the existentialists are essentially a They are a development of Nietzsche, who announced the death of God. But they weren't the only school who were involved in the experimental side of philosophy. In the early half of the 20th century, there were, of course, the structuralists who focused on language. So the existentialists recognized that the, the things we take for granted are not, in fact, granted. They are absurd and should be considered and analyzed but more importantly it's the fact that investigating the fact that you exist is becomes the central topic of interest once it is recognized that everything is absurd it used to, it, supposing we believed in god then maybe the purpose of life could be found in how it is that we are to, to live in this in this ground, in this world, with its conventions and its rules. But then since Nietzsche, there became a need to approach the world in a way that doesn't involve finding the meaning in, in the conventions. It involves investigating what is left when we recognize that our conventions are just conventions. The alternative group were the structuralists and they focused on language and their thinking was that they, they, they all tried to prove that there was some way that language related to reality and they tried to construct a theory that would establish a relationship between language and reality. So one such theory would be that the fundaments of the fundamental connection between language and reality is that of ostentation, which means pointing out. So if I say car and I point at a car, then I am demonstrating the meaning of car. That's how I, pre that's how I create the link between reality and the word. But no one was convinced by that. And eventually they just gave up the project, or they felt that the project was uh, doomed to failure. It, in perhaps the same way as Nietzsche realized that the project of establishing the city of God was doomed to failure. And of course they 
then are forced to acknowledge that whatever truth they come to with their language is not tied in any way to reality and that whatever truth they come to may just be a result of the rules of that language. So it's almost a Wittgensteinian uh, reduction of all the problems of philosophy to problems of language and then throwing out the problems as being nothing but misunderstandings based on the problems of language. Now, most philosophers nowadays recognize the power and significance of language and that in some sense the language that we use constructs the concepts. So we don't just have these concepts pre-existing in our mind which we employ language to express, but the language implants those concepts. Those concepts are necessary in order to manipulate the language so that we can express ourselves. So the language is not just a neutral uh, transmission device, it is a lens. That being said, the more interesting topic still remains that despite the fact that there is no provable connection between language and reality, the fact that we exist is still inexplicable. And it seems to me that the structuralists and the post-structuralists and the post-modernists all forgot the experience which motivated Nietzsche and which motivated Sartre and, and Camus and Heidegger, which was the experience of complete and utter bewilderment at existence. The, the take-home message from structuralism, to me at least, seems to be that there will be no description in words that will satisfy the curiosity of the existentialists. There will be no... It's a... The existentialists might be grasping at the notion of existence for some concrete anchor by which they can connect themselves to reality. They feel aloof and absurd. But the point with Camus is that things are inherently absurd. So to experience them as absurd is to experience them as they actually are and is the most direct connection to reality. So to recognize that there is no real connection between language and reality is part of the is, is necessary to understand our situation in the world. However, the postmodernists seem to have forgotten about the bewildering experience. So they speak of how discourse constructs constructs concepts. So Foucault would talk about how the discourse of science it's not actually the things explicitly being stated by science which are the point but it's the rules that govern the scientific endeavor which distort the thinking of people. They are a lens so it's not a tool for just attaining objective reality because as we've accepted from the structuralists there is no such tool for all such tools must be expressed in language and language is not logically entwined with reality. But, that being said, there is still lacking in the description, in the descriptions of Foucault and of Derrida, the appreciation for the fact of existence. They seem to have redirected the visionary genius of Nietzsche which was then expressed and systematized by Sartre and Heidegger and Camus, or at least attempted to be systemized by them. They don't appreciate that experience. That whole energy which produced Nietzsche and which produced Sartre and Heidegger, these experimental philosopher geniuses who attempted to create new language to describe reality. In energy, that emotional experience of bewilderment uh, is forgotten. And I don't think it's done, un done unintentionally, although I think it's done unconsciously. It seems to me that the chain of thought, starting with post-structuralism, which amounted to post-modernism, is a burying 
of the head in the sand. It's a desperate running away from the nausea and anxiety produced by the experience of of recognizing the arbitrariness of our position in the world. So in conclusion, postmodernism is a neurosis and the if we take a Freudian approach, we'll find that the childhood trauma which led to that neurosis is the death of God. And the only the only group discussing the death of God and the anxiety in the face of existence is the existentialists and perhaps some of the philosophers that they spawned. I might mention Carl Jung, not as a philosopher of course, but certainly someone who attempted to resolve the neurotic condition produced by the death of God as proclaimed by Nietzsche.